Trim and live. Trim and live. <laughs> what do I say? Apart from the fact that. Um, what, what do I say? Don't say, <laughs> don't say it. No, right. <laughs> what, what, money, money can change that. <laughs> um, apart from being much loved colleagues of mine, um, they also established themselves long before in their own right with the Turin Shroud, which you've been given a copy of, um, and with their bestseller, Temple Revelation. Um, the position they take in this is um, controversial, to say the least. Um, what would we expect? Um, they deal with something, however, which is very important and which is what they're going to be addressing on today, uh, which is the Templar's interest in John the Baptist and perhaps devotion more closely to John the Baptist, and I'm referring to the ancient order now particularly, and to the Yoanite tradition, than to the, um, what we would term conventional Christian Christianity, i.e. the teachings of the Baptist as put forward by Christ later on. Um, they, I won't go for much further than that because otherwise Lynn will start saying I'm wrong. So, um, and she's our sort of Übersturmbaum Führer. Um, so I won't risk the wrath. I will say that their book is on sale outside and they'll be delighted to sign copies at no extra charge. And um, I will let them loose on you. I can say nothing else. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. Could I just make sure you can, everyone can hear okay? Uh, people at the back, Steve, yeah, good. well done. Um, yes, that was... The way I want to approach this is to start by addressing a question that I think probably uh, uh, most of you here will be interested in, which is the, the modern Templar orders um, uh, that Stephen was talking about at the beginning. Um, do they really have any connection with the medieval Knights Templar? Um, and as Stephen said earlier, that their kind of corporate position if you like, is really maybe, but it doesn't really matter. Um, the, the modern orders, the, the, the various um, national priories and the international movement, can trace itself back to 1804, when there was an order of the temple um, set up in Paris. Um, but it's a question of whether that was... Uh, founded in 1804, or whether the order was revived in 1804. The, the founder of the 1804 order claimed that he was actually reviving the medieval order, which had never gone away. It had just been a, uh, hiding for you know, 500 years, and he had documents to prove it. And the, the orders that are around today that are connected with NATO and the United Nations trace their descent from that, but they're saying beyond, beyond 1804, it doesn't really matter. But despite that line, uh, the, the Templar's official line today, Lynn and I believe that there is a direct continuation all the way through from the medieval Templars through to this order of the Temple that was set up in 1804 and therefore through to today's orders. Uh, but the reason we think, it, think that is because we came at it from quite a, a, an unusual direction. And I'll briefly explain the chain of events that, that got us there. And surprisingly, it actually started with our research into uh, the Turin Shroud, uh, which led to the first book that we wrote together back in 1994, uh, which you all, all should have a copy of. Um, and very briefly, I mean, without wanting to give the plot away, but the title pretty much does it, um, we came to the conclusion that the Turin Shroud is a fake. It was faked by Leonardo da Vinci. Um, but it's, the story is more interesting than it just being a fake. He did it for particular reasons. Um, and looking at his motives, Leonardo's motives, led us to a rather neglected area of the European esoteric traditions, a thing called the Johannite tradition, which is a, a set of beliefs and ideas that centre on the importance of John the Baptist, and just to 
quickly deal with a, a complicating issue that's just far too complicated to go into. You sometimes also get the term Johannite used of traditions and beliefs centred on another St John, which is St John the Evangelist, the disciple of, of Jesus. Um, but in this talk, when I say Johannite, the, the, the John of Johannite in this talk is the Baptist. There is actually a relationship between the two traditions, but it you know, it would take hours to explain uh, you know, what that is. Um, very briefly, our research into Leonardo and the Turin Shroud, uh, when we're looking at Leonardo and his motivations, we found that he had this, what amounts to a kind of fixation on John the Baptist, which is very odd because Leonardo da Vinci was... I mean, certainly known to be no lover of the church, no lover of Christianity. He's either thought of as, at best, an atheist, at worst, uh, a heretic. So he's got this thing about a, a Christian saint, this kind of real obsession that runs through his paintings. Um, and um, when you actually look at it, in a kind of coded way, Leonardo and his paintings, and there are uh, examples of this in the book, um, is saying that John the Baptist is really important. In fact, he's saying he, he considers him to be more important than Jesus. And following on from that, um, again, cutting a long story very short, this led then I to look at um, uh, various secret societies and esoteric groups that were part of this Johannite tradition um, and who are around today, and this is what led us to write the, the, the Templar Revelation. Um, and all these groups that are around, um, they claim that they're descended from the Templars, the medieval Templars. They also proclaim themselves to be Johannite. They have this same emphasis on John the Baptist and the suggestions that he's important, not just as the forerunner of Jesus, but somehow important in his own right, and sometimes you, know, you often get the feeling that they're saying he's actually more important than Jesus. Uh, and it's a whole network of related secret societies and groups which form, form this, this network. Um, to pick one, because it's a, a fairly well-known name, it's the, the Priory of Zion, which became famous in the 1980s in the Holy Blood and the Holy Grail. And the Priory of Zion, for example... Uh, says that it was founded during the Crusades. It was founded alongside the Knights Templar, uh, and the, the two organisations were kind of two wings of the, uh, of the same society. Um, but they say the reason they were both founded is because some of the leaders of the First Crusade, when they were in the Middle East, having captured Jerusalem, encountered what they called the Church of John. And the secrets that they learned from these, this Church of John led these crusader leaders to found both the Priory of Zion and the Knights Templar. And the Knights Templar, again, in the Priory of Zion's um, documents, the Templars are referred to as the sword bearers of the Church of John. Priory of Zion also present a list of their alleged Grand Masters since the 12th century, which includes all kinds of famous names throughout history, uh, including Leonardo da Vinci, who they say was Grand Master in his day, which is obviously why we started getting interested in this. Um, they have this thing where the Grand Master always takes the title John, so that Leonardo da Vinci was John the Ninth, and the, his successor as Grand Master, they say, became John the Tenth. But they actually start... That their first Grand Master, who was a French knight back at, in, the, in the Crusades... Um, is listed as John the Second, and if you ask the Priory of Zion why, who, who was John the First, they say that just enigmatically that the title John the First is symbolically reserved for Christ, and which makes you think, well, why should Jesus, assuming when they say Christ they mean Jesus, be honoured by being given the name John? Um, now this network of societies, the Priory of Zion is a lot of you probably realise it's really controversial. It claims it's been around for 900 years. Its critics say it was made up in 1956. Um, and, and very briefly, and it's something we've firmed up on since we wrote Temple Revelation, Lynn and I think actually the Priory of Zion as such was created in 1956. 
but it was a front for other societies that are, have a, a bit of a better pedigree that you can trace back for 200, 250 years. Okay, it's not 900 years, but it's, it's further back than 1956. And they're passing on bits and pieces of these uh, uh, esoteric traditions from these Johannite groups. All of which, all, all of these societies, you can trace back to a system, kind of irregular system of Freemasonry uh, called the Strict Temple Observance, which was founded in the middle of the 1700s. Um, in fact, it, it called itself Strict Temple Observance later. It, when it was originally formed, it was called the Brethren of St. John the Baptist. And this was the first Masonic system that explicitly claimed that Freemasonry uh, had, had its origins amongst uh, fugitive Knights Templar who had fled to Scotland and formed, uh, to keep themselves secret, had formed uh, an underground organisation that became Freemasonry. But the claims of the strict Templar observance, particularly the, you know, the, the claims of a, a Templar heritage, were rejected by mainstream Freemasons, eventually even rejected by itself later. Um, but it did survive, and several other sort of esoterically based Masonic systems, the ones that are all connected to the Priory of Zion today, evolved from that and are still around. But of course, th th this idea that Freemasonry, that there's a link between Templars and Freemasonry um, that happened in Scotland. Uh, is taken a lot more seriously today. There's a lot more historical evidence. Um, for example, Roslyn Chapel, where I think most of you are going tomorrow, if you haven't already been, is an important link in that chain between Templars and Masons. Um, and Len and I personally are convinced that there is a connection between Freemasonry and the medieval Templars. Uh, just uh, the interesting thing is that the, the, actual, the first people to really make that claim of a link between Templars and Masons wasn't the Masons, it was actually their opponents, their enemies, uh, the Catholic Church. But in 1738, the Pope, Clement XII, issued this edict, sort of basically condemning Freemasonry on the grounds that it was a continuation of the Knights Templar, which a previous Pope had abolished and, uh, because of the heretical practice of its members. Then if you actually go, turn to the mainstream Freemasonry, just in, in the form that we're familiar with today, again you've got this undercurrent of veneration for John the Baptist, uh, alongside John the Evangelist, but it's the, the two St. John's are important. Um, and it's been there from, right from the beginning, from when we first know of Freemasonry. And two things are very clear, that this emphasis on John the Baptist is considered vitally important, but Freemasons have actually no idea why. And you find a lot of Masonic writings uh, amongst their historians and scholars trying to work out this question, why do we have this thing particularly about John the Baptist? Uh, the Masonic Oath is sworn to the Holy Saints John. You find a lot of John, sort of Johannite symbolism in Freemasonry. The feast day of John the Baptist, which is the 24th of June, was a very important day to the Freemasons as it had been to the Templars. Uh, Grand Lodge of England, the central authority for Freemasonry in England, was deliberately founded on John the Baptist Day in 1717. Um, but, so it's there, this, this emphasis on John the Baptist is there, but it's very clear Freemasons have no idea why that should be. It's just a core part of their traditions. 